This is CBC Here and Now. And they're off, mountain bike mania. Coming up, why riders are racing around Confederation Hill. The Liberal Party will come at it again. They're strong, energized, prepared for 2019. And I'll be the leader of the party. Dwight Ball is not at all concerned going into this weekend's leadership review. The Premier was in Carboneer today promising good news for long-term care. She's a family member and she's my best friend. His car stolen, his best friend, his dog still inside. It happened in an instant and tonight he's sharing his story. To think about the, them two hours of what she went through and being in that vehicle when it rolled over. Good evening, I'm Debbie Cooper. And I'm Jeremy Eaton. Another accident at Muskrat Falls. A crane tipped over at the site late last night, leaving one worker injured. As investigators try to piece together what happened, Jacob Barker has been gathering details and has this report. We do know that the operator of the crane was not badly injured, but he was taken to hospital as a result of the accident. So what do we know? Well, Astaldi, the main contractor, for the project here did give us some details about what happened. It said a crane being used to take a different crane apart tipped over during the process. The company behind that is Capital Cranes, a subcontractor for Astaldi. Capital Cranes along with Nalcor and Astaldi are all now looking into the circumstances around the accident. Occupational health and safety officers have also been deployed to take a look at just what happened here. In a statement, Nalcor said it will ensure a full safety investigation is completed and that the contractor and its workers implement all safety recommendations that might be identified following the incident. This comes on the heels of the news that Estaldi is suing an American company for an incident in 2016 where a formwork failed leaving several workers covered in concrete. And while work did continue by other contractors on site today, Estaldi did suspend its day shift another delay in an already very delayed project. Jacob Barker, CBC News, at the Muskrat Falls Gate. The recent parade of positive health care announcements continued today, this time millions for improvements to acute and long-term care in Carboneer. This on the eve of an annual general meeting for the governing Liberals, one that will see Premier Dwight Ball's leadership put to the test. Here now's Terry Roberts was in Carboneer today. A room full of grateful health care providers. I'm happy. I have to be very honest. I think we're all delighted on site that this is happening. And liberals. A lot of them. But this is not about politics, says the Premier. This has been part of our plan from day one. A double whammy of good news. Five million to create a new ambulatory care space at the Carboneer Hospital. A new hub for endoscopy, chemotherapy, pain services, day surgery and minor procedures, along with a space for improved recovery. A family member that can come in, do a one-stop shop basically at a hospital, uh, that's amazing. It will mean that patients who require clinical care within the hospital on an outpatient basis will have one destination. Services currently dispersed over eight floors, soon to be concentrated. And it's a great recruitment strategy for us as physicians and the opening of the remaining 28 beds at the massive new long-term care facility. There are people in the hospital that probably should be in a long-term care facility, so if we open the new beds, uh, it, it puts those patients where they, where they need to be. All this good news as Dwight Ball prepares to head to Gander. 400 Liberal delegates. All will vote on his leadership, but if he's worried, he's sure not showing it. Not at all am I concerned about going into this weekend. Ball received more than 90% support the last time his leadership was tested. He's not telegraphing a benchmark for success this time, only saying he will get more support than new PC leader Chess Crosby. There's no number. It doesn't, this, is not a, this is not a passing grade. This is, I'll be Premier of Newfoundland and Labrador on Monday. The Liberal Party will be strong and it will be better than Chess of 60. Terry Roberts, CBC News, Carboneer. PC leader Chess Crosby is pushing for an inquiry into the deaths of two inmates at the Women's Correctional Center in Clarenville. He says an inquiry would help restore public confidence in the prison system. The mother of Samantha Piercy was told the 28-year-old mother of two died by suicide. Police say Sky Martin, a 27-year-old mother of one, choked while eating. Justice Minister Andrew Parsons appears to be dismissing Crosby's call. 
He says an independent investigation will be thorough and will examine how staff responded. 29 years ago, he killed his best friend's mother. Then he kept silent as that same friend went to prison for the murder. Now, Brian Doyle is asking the parole board for short-term release. Here now is Arianna Kelland reports. It's a case known as much for its callousness as its depravity. Brian Doyle stabbed Catherine Carroll 53 times after breaking into her St. John's home on New Year's Eve 1990. Carol's son, Gregory Parsons, was convicted for her murder in 1994 and spent four years in prison for a crime he did not commit. He was exonerated in 1998 by DNA evidence. All the while, his childhood best friend, Doyle, kept quiet. Doyle, who's now 48, was sentenced in February of 2013 to life in prison with no chance of parole for 18 years. Now, 15 years on, Doyle wants to get out of jail, at least temporarily. He's asked the Parole Board of Canada for escorted temporary absences, meaning he'd be allowed out for a host of reasons like family contact, community service and rehabilitation. A hearing will be held in July and could include statements from victims, potentially from Greg Parsons, who is left without a mother and for years without freedom, all because of Doyle. An inquiry into Parsons' wrongful conviction, as well as two others, concluded that tunnel vision and poor police work were to blame. Today, Parsons is a firefighter and a family man and says he's not yet ready to comment. Arianna Kelland, CBC News, St. John's. Two weeks after a worker fell to his death, construction remains at a standstill at this downtown St. John's Hotel. 26-year-old Chris Fifield fell from the 12-story building at the corner of Springdale and New Gower Street. The building is the future site of a Hilton Garden Inn. Service NL issued an immediate stop work order to the contractor, and that order is still in place while subcontractors speak with investigators. There's a call tonight for provincial legislation that makes workers' compensation an option for all employees who are mentally injured on the job. NAEP is pushing for the legislation it says would protect all workers who face or witness dangerous, threatening or traumatizing events in their daily work. As here and now's Megan Kwan reports, the exposure can lead to a host of problems such as PTSD, anxiety or sleep disorders. NAEP asked two sociology professors at Memorial University to look at the number of workers in the province who suffer mental health injuries on the job and what government can do to better help them. Unfortunately, Newfoundland and Labrador lags behind other provinces when it comes to legislation in this area. Their findings were released today in a study that says many workers who suffer from some kind of workplace psychological problem either don't file for compensation or, when they do, their claim is rejected. They've come up with recommendations on what can be done to change that. Legislation for mental health injuries that come from chronic stress on the job, and also workers being given the benefit of the doubt when they claim compensation for health care problems. Particular attention has been paid to PTSD in frontline workers, but Rosemary Richardelli says government has to go further. We don't want to limit the legislation to any groups. It's all employees. Even if we move outside of the public safety realms, what happens at work and the unexpected that can happen need to be recognized across the board. The paper also says the low number of successful stress claims in the province is a barrier to getting people the help they need. Removing the barriers to reporting uh, is, is absolutely essential. Uh, and certainly the recommendations, recommendations that we're presenting here are, are aimed principally at that. The union is hoping Workplace NL will take these recommendations and come up with what NAEP calls a progressive piece of legislation that will be passed into law. We don't need small changes. We need massive changes now we approach mental health in the workplace. We need legislative change. Government has slowly been moving in this direction. Back in November, Workplace NL started reviewing its stress compensation policies. And in March, the department accepted that mental health injuries could be caused over time as opposed to by one specific incident. Nate is hoping that's just the start. Megan Kwan, CBC News, St. John's. Well, news that people have been waiting for, Federal Fisheries has just released details of this year's recreational ground fish fishery. The first weekend of fish starts Saturday, June 30th and continues each weekend until Monday, September 3rd. The fall food fishery will run from September 22nd to the 30th. 
The season will be open for a total of 39 days. Now that's down from 46 last year. And while you don't need licenses or tags, the limit is five ground fish a day. So, Miss Stokes, I thought about running this morning, and I stepped outside my door, and it was far too cold Rrr. for my weak skin, so I decided not to. Yeah, it really was chilly this yeah. morning, Beautiful especially. for, what is it, uh, June the 12th? Beautiful I know, day. right? I wish I could tell you that things were going to change sometime soon, but they are not. Yeah. <laughs> in fact, hey. uh, yeah, it's going to be kind of... In fact, it's going to get worse? It's going to get windy, and it's going to be kind of rainy tomorrow, and some parts of Labrador have uh, snow coming tonight. Let's have a look, shall we? Uh, this is a system that's tracking through Labrador tonight, starting in Labrador City, and yes, it is bringing some snow. First rain, then snow. Some areas could see up to 10 centimeters of snow. Northern Peninsula here, you can see, we'll be getting a really good dose of rain overnight tonight about uh, 10 to 20 millimeters of rain and that snow continues there uh, tomorrow morning in southeastern parts of Labrador and there is a special weather statement in effect because of that because they're expecting some wintry driving conditions uh, tonight into tomorrow for southeastern Labrador up through Upper Lake Melville. So you'll want to be careful if you're driving in that area for sure. Could see some flurries as well on the Northern Peninsula uh, tomorrow. Some showers happening for St. John's in the afternoon and some windy conditions as well tomorrow. Things will clear off for a while, but as we get into Thursday afternoon, we have this other system that's going to be coming up through bringing some more rain our way. I'll have those details later. Jeremy. Newfoundland's woods are full of delicious things to eat like this gorgeous river mint. And I'll tell you how forager Sean Dawson is helping more people find them. Coming up on Here and Now. It's a pet owner's nightmare. Your car gets stolen with your beloved dog in the back seat. Well, that's exactly what happened to Colin Hennems. His dog has been found and the two are reunited, but he's speaking out to warn people that things like this can happen in an instant. Now he and I spoke earlier today. Colin, so what happened to you yesterday when you were shopping at Walmart? Uh, I went to uh, Walmart to uh, pick up some mulch to do a bit of landscaping around the house. Uh, I went inside to pay for the mulch as it be stored outside. And uh, when I came out, I uh, went over and got the vehicle out of a parking spot and uh, went over and put the mulch in the car. And uh, I went and put the shopping cart in the coral and as I came back in between the parked cars and that, uh, my vehicle that I had just loaded up with mulch was with my dog and it was just gone. Somebody stole your, your car? Somebody had stole my car. At first I wasn't sure if it was like someone that knew me and my father's vehicle and played a prank. So I kind of ran around the parking lot at first, but when there was no sight of it, then I knew that something was after going wrong and that the car was taken. So how were you feeling yesterday, knowing that your dog was missing with, when the car got stolen? Uh, I don't even, I don't even, I can't even explain it. I, uh, I was just weak and sick to my stomach, and I, I, it's still, it's still a tough one to swallow. Just, just to think about the, them two hours of what she went through and being in that vehicle when it rolled over. When did the uh, the stolen car saga end, and how did it end? Uh, from it, what you know, from what I know, it is, it was just there a mobile, but in Taurus Cove, uh, it had collided with another car. It apparently, it's have said that when they had seen an RCMP cruiser on the road, is when they had must have panicked and lost control of it, going down over an embankment and rolling the car over, and. Uh, as bad as the people that had took the vehicle were, it, apparently uh, the girl, one of the people that were in it had tied the dog on with her lace out of her sweater and held her on until police were on, on arrival. What kind of injuries did your dog suffer in that crash? Uh, we brought her to a vet where they assessed her and that she has a little bit of trouble with her breathing now and uh, Right now, she's got too much swelling to be able to get any x-rays done, so when the swelling goes down, we'll have to get x-rays to uh, see if, if there's any internal bleeding within the next few days. How much do x-rays like that cost? Uh, we, were, we were told that it could 
be between six to eight hundred, all depending on the number of x-rays they have to take and any other process that they have to go through. And I understand you started an online campaign to try to raise a bit of that money? Yeah, I did. Like I said, my, my uh, father, my parents are retired and uh, I'm, I'm on EI right now, so $800 is a lot of money for, so we, for the first time we figured we'd try to reach out and get a bit of support and help with the, uh, the cost. When did you first get to this dog? How long has Baby been your dog and where did she come from? Baby, I, uh, I rescued her about three, 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 four years ago. I uh, got her from a lady who had temporarily taken her into her home. Uh, she was on Kijiji and I went and the moment that I saw her, I brought her home and now I'd, my parents would throw me out before they throw her out. She's a, she's a family member and she's, her, she's my best friend. Oh, Babe looks none the worse for wear, but Colin is still shaking, isn't yeah, he? Yeah, certainly <laughs> is. Now, I spoke with the RNC earlier today, and they confirmed that a 17-year-old girl has been charged with stealing the car the baby was in, dangerous operation of a motor vehicle, and failing to stop for police. Now, there were two other people in the Kia that belonged to Colin's father, and police say that this incident is still under investigation. <laughs> A nickel boom brings good news for Boise's Bay and for the town of Long Harbor. Find out why in three minutes.
News yesterday of a $2 billion investment for an underground mine at Valet's operations in Voices Bay is a huge shot in the arm for the provincial economy and a huge boost for the town of Long Harbor, home to Valet's nickel processing plant. A deal was struck 16 years ago to develop the mine in Voices Bay with its world-class deposits of nickel, copper and cobalt. Valet built a nickel processing plant at Long Harbor, but with a slump in nickel prices, their plan to expand the Labrador operation was put on hold until yesterday, extending the life of the mine and the processing plant by at least 15 years. Joe Bennett is president of the Long Harbor Development Corporation. Thanks very much for joining us. This is no doubt welcome news. What does it mean for your town? Well, it means quite a bit, Debbie. Uh, thanks. Uh, it, this is a pretty exciting time for the town of Long Harbor, Mount Arlington Heights. Uh, you know, it means uh, an affirmation of Ballet's long-term commitment to the town of Long Harbor, and also, of course, as well as the province and the Aboriginal peoples of Labrador. From a practical perspective, it means a, a guaranteed supply of raw materials uh, to support the Ballet's plant here, production plant here in Long Harbor. And also, of course, it means stabilization of things like employment levels uh, for our community, for our residents. And I must say, in that regard, uh, both the town and ballet have been working uh, jointly to try and increase the number of local people working on the ballet site. Uh, it secures our tax base, which is important to the long-term viability of the community, and it helps us with things like infrastructure and program development. And of course, and, and from my perspective, it encourages economic development and it gives us an opportunity to uh, to diversify our economy as uh, hopefully uh, commercial customers will come to Long Harbor to uh, be involved in the procurement uh, opportunities associated with the ballet plant. So from a number of perspectives, uh, this is very exciting news uh, from, from the point of view of the town of Long Harbor. Well, let's break it down a little bit. Uh... As for employment, do you have any sense of what that uh, will be, what it will be increased to in Long Harbor? Well, there are about 650 people working over in, in, in the, on the Valet site currently, uh, both employees of, uh, of Valet and as well as employees of their embedded contractors that are working over on the site providing various uh, goods and services to the Valet, uh, the ballet plant. Uh, right now, we have about uh, 25 or 30 residents of Long Harbor uh, employed full-time over on the site. And now we're working to try and increase that number with ballet through various numbers of programs. Uh, hopefully, in the very near future, we'll see that number increase. As you said a moment ago, you've got now a solid tax base for a number of years. Uh, what's on your wish list uh, for the town? Well, any number of things. We've been, uh, of course, uh, uh, working with Valet for the past uh, 10 years. Uh, you appreciate the fact that when Albright and Wilson uh, left Long Harbor some 25 years ago, uh, following that downturn, there was a, a deterioration of the various infrastructure and an outmigration of residents in the, in the town of Long Harbor. Now, with this kind of stabilization coming before us, we can improve our infrastructure. And Mr. Bennett, uh, there is an opportunity now for new businesses to set up in town, I guess, to supply uh, the plant as it expands. Yeah, that's right. Normally, in, in situations like this, uh, as they get into uh, a, a normal flow of operations, hopefully the various supply companies will see an opportunity to be in closer proximity to the plant and will see fit to come and establish themselves in the business park uh, that, we've, uh, that we've set up here in Long Harbor so that we can accommodate any business. Joe Bennett, and we'll leave it there. I'm sure there are lots of smiles going around still uh, today. Thank you for joining us. Uh, thanks, Debbie. We appreciate the opportunity. Oh, yes, good day on the close. Woo! <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> when you're a full-time forager, you're bound to have a run-in with a rat every now and then. Oh, coming up, meet a man who's cashing in on local plants and fungi.
So earlier I was complaining about how it was too cold to go running today, but we have to appreciate what we have because some people can have it worse. <laughs> <laughs> yep, I'm going to show you the pictures. Uh, these are from Jim Burton of Igloo Lake Lodge, Oof. Labrador. Whoa. It's about 72 miles <gasps> southeast of Happy Valley Goose Bay. Jim's family has owned that lodge for 45 years, and he says he has never seen this much snow and ice. Look at the boys there. Oh, Jim. my, that is jaw-dropping. No complaints from our neck of the no, woods no. at all. <laughs> <laughs> I'll stop my whining. <laughs> and you know what? There is some more snow on the way for that area. Some really messy weather. Let's have a look at our weather on the way headlines. So yes, some snow coming for southern parts of Labrador tonight into tomorrow. And uh, looking at some rain and a lot of wind for parts of the island uh, tomorrow. And some cool temperatures will continue. It's not going to warm up anytime soon, unfortunately. You can see uh, the system moving across Labrador. Labrador changing over to some snow overnight tonight, looking at about two to four centimeters for western parts of Labrador, about five to 15 millimeters of rain there and rain as well hitting the northern peninsula. Probably get the worst of it there, 10 to 20 millimeters there tonight, five to 10 for uh, southern parts of the west coast. And in St. John's, things are going to stay pretty cloudy overnight tonight, but very, very cool. And there is a special weather statement in effect from Environment Canada for southeastern uh, Labrador up through upper Lake Melville because of that snow. It's going to make for some very wintry driving conditions. A lot of people have their snow tires off right now. So if you are in that area, you'll uh, want to be careful if you're going to be driving for sure. So you can see Wednesday at 11 a.m. We're looking at some snowfall there and that continuing down to uh, the northern peninsula as well throughout the day. Temperatures, as you can see, staying pretty cool on the island tomorrow and lots of wet weather. We're looking at winds gusting up to 80 in the east. Not a whole lot of rain in the afternoon, about two to four millimeters there, but things are staying pretty cool in St. John's at 13 degrees for central parts of the island. Not much better. Some showers there as well. 14 degrees in Grand Falls, Windsor, and another shot of rain continuing there for the northern peninsula. So another 10 to 20 millimeters of rain there tomorrow. So it's going to be quite wet there for sure. And that messy mix of rain and snow for southeastern Labrador, five to 10 millimeters of rain and then could get up to 10 centimeters of snow in those higher elevations. So that's why that weather statement is in effect for that area. So as we get into Wednesday night, things clear off kind of nicely. The winds are are quite calm uh, in most places, but then we have another system that will be moving in on Thursday afternoon, bringing some rain to southern parts of the island. I'll have all those details later. Debbie. Thanks, Carolyn. They've been overlooked, forgotten, even dreaded. But Sean Dawson is at the sharp end of a movement that's finding value in local plants and fungi. Here now is Mark Quinn joined Dawson in the woods and fields near St. John's. Sean Dawson is a one-man foraging machine. Today, one of the plants he's gathering is dandelions. Uh, a lot of people in Newfoundland call them pista beds. An annoying weed to many, but Sean is helping re-educate people about their value. Turns out dandelions aren't just for salads, but can also be used in beer. Today I'm picking the dandelion flowers for a IPA, a seasonal IPA that uh, Mill Street Brewery is doing. This isn't the career your high school counselors told you about, but it's where Dawson spends his days, in the woods where he gathers plants like creeping snowberry leaves. If you eat them, they're actually like really minty. They have really minty aftertaste. Stinging nettles, another overlooked treat. It makes a really nice pesto, and you just make it the same as a basil pesto, but you, uh, you blanch, blanch the greens first to uh, take away the sting. These plants flourish in the nitrogen-rich soil near an abandoned chicken farm. One of the pleasures of spending your days outdoors is the opportunity to see wildlife, like this foot-long rat. Woo! <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> No way. Dawson also gathers in abandoned fields like this, where Japanese knotwood, known for ruining gardens and even house foundations, produces delicious spring shoots. It's a pretty hated plant, but uh, I've learned to love it. And then there's this, morel mushrooms, one of the world's most prized wild mushrooms. They aren't supposed to grow on the Avalon Peninsula, but Dawson believes they were brought in with some imported garden mulch. 
people call me and or like message me all the time and say like what's this and what's that and mo most of the time it's not nothing uh, choice or edible but when she showed me a picture of these i was like i rushed to her house i dropped everything i was gone it's not always sunshine in t-shirts but demand is so high that dawson says he's out gathering in all kinds of weather sometimes up to 80 hours per week i regularly supply raymond's and chinch to uh, gypsy tea room adelaide um, go to mallard a lot uh, merchant tavern uh, most of them that are interested in using wild food for sure it means dawson spends his days in some of the province's most beautiful spots but it also means he's always on the move. Mark Quinn, CBC News, somewhere in the woods near St. John's. Looks great. Well, it looks like a lot of fun minus the rack yeah. and the hard work part. But yeah. it'd be nice to be out in the sun. Yeah, but you really, really have to know what you're doing. I think I'd have to study it or maybe go with Sean. Yeah. <laughs> There's a crowd at Confederation Hill for tonight's mountain bike races. Look at them go. There's about 150 racers who are making their way around the track, and we'll have more on that coming up. First race lining up, just about to take off. We'll be right back. Today's weather is luckily holding up for some young mountain bikers in St. John's. They're gathering at Confederation Hill for a rather unique cross-country race on a special track. Organizer Ryan David Butt is joining us live from the race now to tell us all about it. Welcome to the show, Ryan. Thank you for having me, Jeremy. So this is the first race just kicked off behind you. So how's it going over there, Ryan? Uh, it's going really well. Uh, we just started the youngest category and uh, they're just finishing up there now and uh, they had a great lap, a really good showing from uh, some future provincial athletes. So how young are these athletes who are racing there behind you, Ryan? Uh, they're pretty young. Uh, we go from about uh, four and up, basically all ages. Uh, if they can get themselves on a little push bike, then they're on our track out here in St. John's. So if anybody has driven past Confederation Hill, they would have noticed that track. But what is this? What is short track racing? What is this event all about, Ryan? Short track's a really basic form of event. Uh, it's not number of laps you do. It's actually a set amount of time. 
uh, in which you just go around as many times as you possibly can. And so there's a ranking system based off of how many times that you go around, uh, but mostly it's just show up and have fun. That's really it. So we're just watching some uh, some BG footage of a, la a race last year. How did uh, you and the organizers go around, go about making this track there on Confederation Hill? Uh, today it's just been mowed out. That's basically it. It's really simple. You could do it pretty much on any lawn around the province if you wanted to. So long as it was like this, you just go around, mow out a track, and then people go and ride it. So Ryan, uh, I can see behind you there's some young young uh, racers jumping around. But other than the, those youngsters, uh, who else will be racing today? Or this evening, sorry. Uh, well, we got our youngest category, uh, and it basically goes up from there. It doesn't become a timed race uh, until above 10 years old, uh, after which we'll get a little timer going, and uh, it'll go up from there to a master's category, some, uh, you know, older riders. I won't call them senior. <laughs> so, Ryan, four years old seems like a pretty young time to start mountain biking. Uh, is that when you started? Uh, <laughs> no, it's not. I started way later than these guys. Uh, it wasn't until about last year that I actually got a mountain bike. And uh, have you done the race? And can you describe what it's like for our viewers? Uh, it's super fun and it's really easy. Uh, you know, a lot of people might look at this and say that it's, uh, you know, it's hard or they don't want to do badly in front of other people, but really it's just show up and, and do it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a set amount of time. So it's however many times you can go around and you're pretty much just racing yourself. You're not racing other people. So it's really simple and, and really just fun. Show up and, uh, and have a, have a ball. And Ryan, uh, I, I haven't seen this before. I think I saw a little bit of it last year, but how long has this event been on the go? Last year. So it just started last year, and it's probably become the uh, biggest mountain bike event uh, in the province now. So I understand that this is the second Tuesday, but there's a couple more. So how many more races can people expect there on Confederation Hill? Uh, we have two more races, and registration's closed right now, but you know what? It's really fun to come and watch. You see it right behind me. You, you pick any spot on the hill, and you can see the rest of the course, and people love it when you come out and cheer them on. So it would be great if we saw some more people out here just cheering on our racers of all ages. Ryan, I greatly appreciate your time. I understand that you're suited up and ready to ride, so I'll let you get back to it. Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much, guys. Get a free education. You get everything paid for you. Next year we'll see him at the two. English? Yeah, how about it? How do you like English? Things don't always go as planned, and I didn't expect this to happen. When you're in Europe, you're like a rock star. It's a dream, I guess. You're just following your dream.
Welcome back. It's time now to meet two young athletes of the day. This first person is Addison Weeks, who's four years old from Port of Bass. Addison is a new young hockey star from Port of Bass. This is Addison's first year playing hockey, and she enjoys playing the sport with her local Timbit friends. Congratulations, Addison. Keep up the good work. And our second athlete of the day, Aiden Butler, who's 10 years old and is from Fortune. Aiden has been playing hockey since he was three years old and currently plays in the Adam Division with the United Town Pirates in Fortune. He also participates in swimming, soccer, and enjoys playing ball hockey with his friends on the street. Hey, busy guy. Congratulations, Aiden. So he's put away his hockey equipment for the summer. Why? Summer. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, it's yeah, it's, uh, the weather's uh, yeah. anyway. And you know what? That's a good job, jumping off point, actually, because I was going to start with the highs in the province today. So let's have a look at how warm it got uh, in Newfoundland and Labrador today. Yeah, not too impressive, I must say, in St. John's. 10 degrees was the high uh, today. Not much better in Central Parks. Cornerbrook got up to 14 degrees. And, of course, Labrador, pretty chilly. 4 degrees as the high in Nain today. And those temperatures are going to stay pretty chilly uh, over the next few days. Uh, we do have that system that's moving through Labrador this evening turning into snow overnight uh, bringing snow to most of uh, southern parts of Labrador and uh, this band of rain uh, that's going to hit St. John's by about one o'clock uh, tomorrow afternoon. Not a whole lot of rain coming to St. John's but uh, still going to be kind of a gray messy day and there is that special weather statement that's in fact in effect because of the snowfall that's expected in south southeast Labrador up through uh, Upper Lake Melville and uh, Eagle River River that area. So if you're driving, you'll want to be careful for sure. This is the picture for tomorrow on the island. As you can see, temperatures not much better than today. 13 expected as the high in St. John's tomorrow with some showers, about two to four millimeters of rain expected tomorrow. Grand Falls winds are only getting up to about 14. Things should start to clear off on the west coast uh, by er the early afternoon and could see some sunshine there and uh, temperatures getting up to about 10 degrees in Corner Brook. For Labrador, a chance of flurries for Nain and for Lab City. Uh, and we do have that messy mix that will be happening in southeastern Labrador. Could see up to 10 centimeters of snow there in the higher elevations and also about 5 to 10 millimeters of rain. So as we uh, head into Wednesday night in the overnight hours, things start to clear off quite nicely while you're asleep. Uh, but then as we head into Thursday, uh, we are looking at another uh, bit of rain that should be hitting the island uh, by later in uh, the afternoon in the evening hours. So yeah, there is a chance of showers, pretty heavy cloud cover on the island for Thursday. So chance of showers for pretty much everyone. Afternoon showers for St. John's only getting up to nine degrees on Thursday afternoon, but Labrador is looking pretty nice. So a mix of sun and cloud and 15 degrees right across the big land on Thursday afternoon as we head in to Friday. Uh, still looking at quite heavy cloud cover there for the island and the chance of some showers. You can see here that's Friday morning. So yeah, chance of showers pretty much across the board for the island and temperatures still staying cool. Seven degrees on Friday as the high for St. John's a little bit better in western Newfoundland. 14 uh, western Labrador not looking too bad. 13 degrees with a mix of sun and cloud. At least it'll be dry there. And uh, as we head into the weekend Saturday morning, there is a chance we could see some showers here in the east, but uh, looking fairly dry elsewhere. Sunday morning could see another round of showers coming through, looking fairly nice in Labrador, but then it looks like we'll be seeing another system rolling in on Tuesday morning. So you can see all of this wet weather uh, for the island. Uh, the weekend so far looking like chance of showers on Saturday. Temperatures staying fairly cool, just barely breaking the double digits. Sunday potential for clearing in the east and then we're getting into some more wet weather. Slightly warmer though in central Newfoundland on Monday for 16 degrees there. But yeah, we're not seeing it clear off anytime soon. It's staying pretty chilly. Sunday definitely looks like the better day for Happy Valley Goose Bay with 16 as the high there. But then once again, we get back into that wet weather trend. Jeremy. 
Thanks, Carolyn. In national and international news now, U.S. President Donald Trump and North Korean leader Kim Jong-un have wrapped up their historic summit. The two leaders met in Singapore and at the end signed a document. Real change is indeed possible. My meeting with Chairman Kim was honest, direct, and productive. We got to know each other well in a very confined period of time under very strong, strong circumstance. We're prepared to start a new history, and we're ready to write a new chapter between our nations. The two leaders spent five hours in meetings, ending the summit by signing a document in which Trump pledged security guarantees to the North and Kim recommitted to complete denuclearization. Though there were no mentions of verification. Later, Trump shocked the region by saying he had promised to stop military exercises with South Korea. Critics are calling that an unprecedented concession. A top trade advisor to Donald Trump is backing away from some controversial remarks he made over the weekend after the G7 summit. At the time, Peter Navarro said there was a special place in hell for people like Justin Trudeau. Navarro is now calling his comments a mistake. My mission was to send a very strong signal of strength, and this was particularly important on the eve of an even more, a far more important summit in Korea. And the problem is uh, that uh, in conveying that message, I used language that was inappropriate and special place in hell for yeah, the prime minister. Basically, lost um, the power of that message. I own that. That was my mistake. Those were my words. In this country, the Liberal government is trying to get its recreational cannabis legislation passed before the House rises for the summer. The Senate sent the bill back to the Commons last week with dozens of amendments, but the Canadian forces aren't waiting for the final legislation. They've already decided how to deal with the coming new reality. Murray Brewster has the details. It is back to the House of Commons this week for the Liberal government's recreational marijuana bill. And watching from the wings, the Canadian military. There has been much study and debate at D&D &D about how to handle pot among people who handle the guns and drive the tanks. The conclusion, there will be no outright ban. At no point do we have something, I would say, a total ban just on the fact that it's cannabis. We can't do that. If the law says it's no longer a criminal, uh, to have it in your possession like that, it's not a criminal act, and at that time you can't just ban it outright. The military says the new policy on the use of recreational pot will allow them to respect the law, but also allow them to be ready to deploy at a moment's notice. Alcohol is subject to varying restrictions and even outright bans during some overseas operations. What is essentially being proposed is an extension of those rules to include cannabis. There would be periods when its use would be prohibited. Each of the branches, Army, Navy, Air Force, and Special Forces, are being asked to identify occupations where restrictions should apply. All of this is pending final passage of the legislation. Most people join the military for adventures, such as flying planes and helicopters. The commanders say anything that keeps them from doing that tends to be shunned. Murray Brewster, CBC News, Ottawa. We've heard a lot lately about first responders who suffer from PTSD symptoms as a result of their work. Now, Vancouver Fire and Rescue Services have taken on a new recruit to help address that problem. Her name is Lola, and she's a trauma dog with a very special purpose, helping first responders cope with the stresses they encounter on the job. Lola, who was rescued from a shelter, spent the past six weeks getting used to life in the fire halls, including the sounds of the sirens and being around large groups of people. Vancouver Fire says studies have shown nearly half of emergency workers show symptoms of some kind of mental disorder, so Lola is expected to be a very important part of the team's approach to occupational stress. Well, we're just days away from the opening game in the FIFA World Cup in Russia. As hundreds of millions prepare to tune in, a smaller soccer club is in the spotlight in downtown Vancouver. Deborah Goebel has more on how the beautiful game is helping some of the city's most vulnerable come to terms with their struggles. 
In what is the harshness of Vancouver's downtown east side, it seems obstacles are everywhere. Some live within, others were inherited, and sometimes it's just bad luck. But on a field only blocks away, a group of men and women from this neighborhood come together twice a week to play soccer. And it has made all the difference. It changed my life. I quit drugs, alcohol, and cigarettes. Everyone who plays in this Vancouver Street Soccer League has a story. I've uh, dealt with homelessness, dealt with drug addictions, um, and that was before I found out about Street Soccer League. The drop-in game started 10 years ago. And one day I was just uh, walking down the street and to see the guys playing, and the soccer is something is in my blood. So I just joined these guys. There's no signing up, but many come back week after week. It's just like you're coming to the Sunday church here. Every Sunday you see your friends. It's more than teammates. And it's that something more that is changing lives. It sounds a little bit sometimes like a Hallmark card, but it's a simple thing, but it's incredibly powerful. And I've seen people's lives literally turned around. Alex Gerhan says when you're suffering in the downtown east side, you need to find something to love, somewhere where you belong. Not specifically soccer, but you know, if something, yeah. like if they could find something that they can you know, get into and help them get off, I'm sure it would be life changing. In this league, more than half the players are indigenous. I grew up on a reserve. My dad was chief. My mom was like a medicine woman. So I grew up very, very traditional. So it has become life changing too for the many who have lost their cultural way to addiction and homelessness. This week, the team is heading to Alert Bay for an indigenous soccer tournament. You might say it's just a game that kicking a ball around can't change a life, but there are 16 men and women on this team who would strongly disagree. Deborah Goble, CBC News, Vancouver. And here's a look at today's viewer picture of the day. This is a bit of a different one, hey? Oh, it is, and it's... Wow, it's majestic, it just is. like the moose. <laughs> <laughs> Some old colors. sunset, yeah. <laughs> I'll let you know where that picture was taken after the break.
Welcome back, everyone. Sometimes it's just the small moments that remind us of good in the world and revive our faith in humanity. Take a look at what happened in Minnesota last week when a high school pitcher was one strike away from a win that would take his team to the state championship. That guy at the plate, that's his childhood best friend, and he struck him out. But instead of celebrating his, with his team, watch what he does. He consoles his pal at home plate, making sure he was Aww. okay. A heartfelt embrace, and that's an example of true sportsmanship. And that video's been seen all over the world. But it's great to see how he sort of shuns his teammates for a second to chat to his buddy. And I read later that he just said everything's going to be fine, and he hopes that that strikeout doesn't ruin their friendship. Great mm. little video. Speaking of video, this next More one video? comes to us from Outer Cove. And what can we say? The heart wants what it wants. So Barry Lawler decided to cut out a decorative <laughs> silhouette of a moose last weekend, last Wednesday, and this look very at this. real young moose came <laughs> coming back to scope it out, probably wondering why his new friend just isn't moving. <laughs> Wait till mating season. <laughs> that is. <laughs> That's amazing. <laughs> he was probably just kicked out by his mama yeah. <laughs> and looking for a buddy. Well, what a perfect segue to our viewer picture of the day, yeah. which is a silhouette of a moose with a beautiful backdrop. But it's it not is. a cardboard cutout. No, no it's the real <laughs> moose for sure. And this uh, lovely shot was taken in Trapassi. Uh -huh. mm. Yeah. So thank you very much to Clifford Doran for posting this one. And that sunset is absolutely spectacular. It is gorgeous. Mm. Thought I'd take a break from all the gorgeous iceberg shots, which we also love. We love all the pictures that you send <laughs> in, so keep them coming. <laughs> Thanks for being with us. That's our show for this evening. We'll all be back here tomorrow. Hope you'll join us. Good night. Good night. <laughs>